Welcome to Cancer Newsline, a podcast series from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Newsline helps you stay current with the news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, providing the latest information on reducing your family's cancer risk. I'm your host, Lisa Garvin. Today, our subject is lymphoma, in particular mantle cell lymphoma, and I have two guests to talk about that today. They are both from MD Anderson's Department of Lymphoma and Myeloma. We have Dr. Jorge Romaguerra, who is a professor, and Michael Wong, who is an associate professor. First of all, let's start with the basics. Let's talk about there are two types of lymphoma. We have Hodgkin's lymphoma and then a whole group of lymphomas that are non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's lymphoma. So mantle cell, Dr. Romaguerra, is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yes, it is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lymphomas in general are about 40 subtypes, and they're divided between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Most of them are in the non-Hodgkin's category, and uh, one of those is uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Lymph glands are obviously, there are lymph glands or nodes throughout your body, and the the lymph fluid travels through, and the lymph carries, like, uh, lymphocytes that help us fight disease and so forth. Dr. Romaguerra, tell me exactly where the mantle cells are in in a lymph node. One of the main ways of differentiating um, the 40 or so subtypes of lymphoma uh, is how they look under the microscope, and... uh, the mantle cell is derived from a zone called the mantle zone, which is located on the outer portion of the follicle. The follicle is uh, the main uh, ingredient of the lymph nodes. The lymph node is composed of many follicles. And um, that is where the mantle, zo- mantle cell lymphoma derives its name from. And it's pretty rare. As, as non-Hodgkin's lymphomas go, it's fairly rare, isn't it? It's about 6% of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Do, you, do we see a lot of mantle cell lymphoma here at MD Anderson because we're a big cancer center, Dr. Wong? Yes. Uh, we, mantle cell lymphoma, as Lisa, as you pointed out, is a rare disease in the community. But it is a very common disease. It's the focus of our clinical and uh, translational and basic research of our group, especially with Dr. Romaguerra and me. We are focusing on mantle cell lymphoma. Because we are a very uh, uh, wide, uh, uh, big referral center, and it, although it is rare in the community, but uh, we see mantle cell lymphoma every day in our daily practice. It is a very common tumor for us. And it's typical. What is the typical population affected by mantle cell? The typical uh, anywhere between the statistics vary. The 6% is an international population. Actually, Dr. Romaguerra and I did a 30-year incidence in the U.S. by the SEER, S-E-E-R data, that trained, summarized the 30-year experience in the U.S. population with mantle cell lymphoma affected. Our calculation was about 3%. So the data varies between 3 to 6%. The people diagnosed is between uh, anywhere between 4,000 to 10,000 people each year with this disease. depends on the data. And the typical analysis. patient is? Typical patient is a person with around 65 years old male who is Caucasian. And, uh, of course, you know, there's ladies, there's uh, African-Americans and Asians, other population. Typical is a 65-year-old gentleman, Caucasian gentleman with lymph nodes. Now, how, how do these patients generally present? Because lymphoma is like le- leukemia. It's not mm-hmm. really a mm-hmm. solid tumor per se. Mm-hmm. So um, how do your patients generally present? Do they come in complaining of flu-like symptoms or how do they generally get diagnosed? Yeah. Uh, Actually, only about 20% present with symptoms such as fevers or sweats or weight loss. The sweats would have to be drenching to be called sweats due to lymphoma. Uh, Most of them, all they feel a lump somewhere in the body, usually the neck, under the arms, maybe in the groin. Or what we're seeing more and more often is that they go to the doctors, they did a blood count and they saw that the lymphocytes were higher and then they do special tests called the flow cytometry tests 
to detect a population of lymphocytes, and they can detect that there is a clone of cells of those lymphocytes. They're all coming from the same mother cell, if you want. And that's one of the criteria in lymphoma for uh, calling something a lymphoma. They usually are all what they call monoclonal. They come from the same cell. And you can detect that in flow cytometry when you do the test in the blood. Now, lymphomas are staged slightly differently from solid tumors. You have you have like an indolent group, which is slow growing, mm-hmm. and then you have an aggressive group, but then you have other criteria as mm-hmm. well. So I- explain in, how you stage in it. In metal cell lymphoma, just as we described in the in the paper published in 2008 in cancer, is actually uh, publicly available. In that, 90, over 90 percent of the patients present at stage four. Therefore, mm-hmm. stage, very few patients pre- present at early stages. So mantle cell lymphoma occurs, is an insidious disease, is usually discovered late in the phase. Actually, yeah, this uh, staging system that we started to use in mantle cell, for lack of a better staging system, although now we are using other criteria, was an old staging system devised in the 1980s for actually for Hodgkin's stage one, two, three, four. And four was anything outside of lymph nodes, extranodal. And uh, it just so happens that practically all mantle cell lymphomas have some involvement of the bone marrow, which by definition is an extranodal site. So even if they had nothing elsewhere, no lymph nodes, they're automatically a stage four. Also, about 90% of uh, mantle cell patients have it, have the disease in their, in their uh, small, uh, in their uh, large intestine, although mostly without symptoms. But if we, you look for it and do a colonoscopy and biopsy, even if you don't see polyps, you will find microscopic disease. Why? We don't know. We, we would like to share with, with our audience that a mantle cell lymphoma is, the, although a deadly disease, if untreated, is rapidly fatal. But therapies has been changing the patient's life for many, many years. We started the top ther- therapy. Our top therapy is the old standard. Dr. Rumagera in 2005 pioneered a study called Ritox and Harper CVAD, alternating with the Ritox and Methotrexate cytotherapy. That response rate is over 97%. The complete response rate is nearly 90%. Dr. Romagera and I did a 10-year follow-up with the data. Is after 10 years, many, many people survived. And it, but mantle cell lymphoma is considered not curable. But we have so many clinical uh, agents. Mantle cell lymphoma is one of the most rapidly advancing fields in the field of lymphoma and the liquid hematological diseases. So, so the goal in mm. in treating mantle cell lymphoma is not really a cure, but but managing the disease. Or, I mean, what is the end goal here? If it's number not one, complete improve cure? the patient's survival. Number two, decrease their suffering and improve the quality of their life. Mantle cell lymphoma shall be cured. is a time, matter of time, and we are making so much progresses. And this point that. Uh, we do have so many good drugs, good agents, that uh, the uh, median survival is increasing every, uh, almost every uh, few short time. We will have new survival data. And Dr. Romagheri, you were saying that actually the survival rate has jumped by about a year or two years, just in a short time. Well, right. Uh, the, in uh, two or three years ago, the Germans published data showing that their more aggressive regimens improve survival uh, by, by and, and the, in general, the quoted survival is five to six years versus three to four, which was uh, 10 years ago. I believe that's part in part due to the addition of uh, antibodies, like the rituxans, so it's called now chemo immunotherapy. And... Uh, I think we're also getting a better handle of it. Not all mantle cells are very aggressive. There is a system now. There is a staging, not a staging necessarily, but a risk model that determines uh, in many institutions, and this has been confirmed, you know, uh, how aggressive the tumor will behave down the road. So we are able to diagnose patients earlier. And I think that in part explains that 
we can track them longer and our survival has improved. I'd like to share with the audience that uh, there's a concentrated knowledge at Emily Anderson that has been going on, for, been in the development for many years by many generations of clinical and basic research. And we have our contribution from our group and Emily Anderson on Manosol and Pharma has been instrumental and critical in each step of the clinical and the basic research development. Dr. Rongera and I are uh, the main main, but we are not all. We have the Mental Solon Pharma Program of Excellence is actually comprised of many colleagues from Stem Cell Transplant. Dr. Chaplin, uh, the chairman of Stem Cell Transplantation, because Mental Solon Pharma has to be treated with the chemotherapy and trans stem cell options. Dr. Larry Kwok, our um, chairman of the Department of Lymphoma Myeloma, is also part of this uh, mantle cell lymphoma program. But we have also Dr. Frederick Hagenmaster, the uh, people who has been working on dedicated mantle mm -hmm. cell lymphoma for many years. We have a big group. But this are uh, this are not all. We have many colleagues in um, in the laboratories research, and uh, and. Uh, doing the preclinical work, they have been focusing their careers. And our group have many, many people, research nurses, data coordinators, post-doctors, associate professors, full professors, whose lives are, whose main focus area is mental cell lymphoma. But we wanted to translate this into clinical medicine, and I would like to share you a brief moment later of what is in the making. Well, and 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 this seems to be uh, there are several. There's like monoclonal antibodies. There's other targeted therapies. So, the new more sophisticated or personalized chemotherapy seemed to be a good fit for lymphoma treatment. That's exactly the, what's going on. For example, there's a right hox science already made uh, made uh, the monoclonal antibody right hox map already made history in, is part of the standard therapy metallocell and formula is incorporated in the hyper c uh, program was after that was called a drug called bortezomib bortezomib is also is it belongs to the class of proteasome inhibitors is fd approved just for metallocell and formula that is relapsed after the frontal frontline setting. So this is the drug that is not approved for other lymphomas, but only approved for mantle cell lymphoma. This approval not only brought a new option to the patients, but also make, may, together with other development made mantle cell lymphoma a inviting target for new drug therapies to, to test. As a result, many other drugs are test, being tested. For example, one of the talk of the day is called the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. This is an oral pill that takes once a day. I presented, we are, Emily Anderson is a leading institution for this international phase two clinical trial. Dr. Rumagera and I uh, together uh, with many other colleagues did this trial. I presented it at, at the American Society of Hematology in December in 2011. With only a single agent oral drug that has minimal side effect, the response rate is already 80%. Many of my patients are still on the trial after more than one year of therapy, and they have good quality of life, and their blood counts are not terribly affected, and uh, as a result, our institution is again leading an international trial to try to this, get this drug to be FDA approved so that it will be available to the patients in the United States and North America and in the future to the world. And, and what, what is life like for a mantle cell lymphoma survivor? I mean, it sounds like it's a life of... of constant surveillance. I mean, it sounds like they would have to yeah. pretty much have a relationship with their oncologist the rest of their life. Yes, they have to be. We have to be monitoring them. If we achieve a complete response, clinical complete response with the therapy that we give, and we finish the treatment, we still have to do x-ray studies every three months for a year, every four for the next two, every six for the next two, because we know at some point it will show its face, and hopefully by then we'll have a, another drug that is easier to take, that is less toxic and can control the, 
the lymphoma for as long as possible. So we go from drug to drug trying to keep them alive with good quality of life. And would you say, uh, the, uh, the, uh, similar to our leukemia patients here, that probably about 85% of leukemia patients are on some sort of protocol. Is that also true with mantle cell lymphoma? We strive to uh, make the, all the protocols that we have accessible to them sometimes because they live far, far away in another state, and the protocol requires for them to be close to us. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot offer that trial to them. Some of them actually make a huge commitment and stay in Houston for six months to get the drug. It, it depends. Uh, the Bruton Starosin kinase inhibitor, for example, which is a pill, it allows you to f go back